Hey everybody, it's Rabbit. Welcome to the channel. And today we're going to be looking at how to grind to the top of the American ground tree and get your very own M1 Abrams. We're going to start the video by looking at some general techniques that apply both to free to play and paid players. And then towards the end of the video, we're going to start looking at uh, things like premium vehicles that can potentially speed up that grind. Now one thing I will note about grinding ground trees versus grinding air trees, for example if you saw my F14, F16 video, is that while grinding an air tree you only need one spawn for air realistic battles because you only get one spawn. However, in ground battles a lot of the rewards multipliers are based around you having multiple spawns. And this leads to an awkward scenario where just having one spawn, if you're only getting like one kill or even if you're dying right away with no kills, often leads you spending several minutes in matches for essentially no reward multiplier. Like you're not really getting anything meaningful out of it and you are getting a repair cost. And I noticed very quickly that whenever I was taking two to three spawns into a match, I was doing significantly better for a variety of reasons. Uh, number one, if I know that I'm in a match that I can do well, I have the option to stay in that match, uh, whether it be because the map is favorable or because the types of enemies that are favorable or the battle ratings that I'm playing at are favorable. Number two, the one death matches, especially if you get a little unlucky and just die before you kill anything, start to get very disheartening, and this in turn reduces your performance, which increases the likelihood that you get more of these, and loading into a match, driving to a place, dying, and then having to load into a different match, this is a time-consuming process, and if you don't get any good RPs from it, uh, you can lead to like some really bad inefficiencies. So even though it technically seems more efficient, it's actually less efficient. Additionally, spawning in and bringing back a close game is very motivating. So you generally perform better on the next game subsequently. So it created this kind of loop where, you know, if I had enough spawns, I had the option where if I say I see a bad game, I can just exit out. But if I see a good game, I can keep playing, maximize my rewards, you know, make sure the time I'm getting, I'm earning good RP and kind of maximize the time spent in game. So as much as I know it's a popular thing for people to just get one vehicle and play, I really think you should look at means to have at least two, ideally three spawns, even if that's just using backup vehicles for that one vehicle. And piggybacking on that concept, one thing that I also generally do when I start grinding a tech tree is I immediately pick up all the crew slots that I can pick up from silver lines alone. Um, the reason that you do this is because this will be useful throughout the entire tech tree, and if you don't need them, you don't have to use them. It's not Nothing forces you to put crew in those slots. But the uh, silver investments to get additional crew slots is relatively minor, and you can use it continually throughout your entire time playing that nation. And because obviously ground forces work more on lineups, and that's generally how you want to try to build, uh, it is beneficial to just go ahead and get these crew slots out of the way quickly. The silver investment is incredibly small, it won't affect your grinding at all, and it does just like add that option that you can use at any time. Now it's important to keep in mind that your tech tree is going to be divided into ranks, and each rank you need a specific number of vehicles to progress to the next rank. So when you're trying to figure out which lines that you want to research, you need to make sure that each of those lines combined can fill out enough slots to move on to the next rank at all levels. And this will make sure that you don't get into a roadblock where you have to go back and go through a completely different line of vehicles. Additionally, each vehicle has a vehicle that will give you a bonus if you use it to research it, and this is usually the vehicle that comes immediately before it in the line. So for example, you get a research bonus for uh, researching the M1A2 SEP with the M1A2. However, because of the nature of ground forces and it's hard to guarantee that you're staying in one vehicle for an entire match, this isn't as easy to go for and I wouldn't go out of my way to try and make sure that I'm always researching a vehicle with a specific other vehicle. Uh, just, it's a nice thing to keep in mind, but it's not really that important. Now with all of that out of the way, the American ground tech tree is divided into a total of five lines. The first line is going to be the light tank line. The light tank line has some really good vehicles, a lot of them work well in up tiers, and it has a pretty good population of vehicles as well. Additionally, they are mobile, they have scouting, they can get to capture points easily, so the light, point, light tank line is probably a good pick for one of your lines. Next up you have the medium tank line. The medium tank line has a pretty good density of solid vehicles. However, the medium tank line does terminate pretty early at around 9.0 with the M60A3. And additionally, the M48 and M60s are not exactly like standout vehicles. So even though the medium tank line has some good low and mid tier offerings, their higher tier offerings leave something to be desired. 
The heavy tank line is required if you actually want to go into the Abrams themselves, so it's not really worth dwelling on whether you should. However, the heavy tank line in general is pretty good, and they have some fairly solid vehicles. Although a lot of the heavy tanks, until you start getting up into the Abrams, don't work that well above their battle rating, so in max up tiers, some of them can definitely struggle. Next up, you have the anti-aircraft line. Now, the American anti-aircraft line is a little weird because while you have quite a few high-tier entries, your low- and mid-tier entries are incredibly weak and inconsistent. My general advice is that it's not a bad idea to pick up the M16 MGMC because the Quad 50 Cals remain a pretty effective AA weapon throughout most of the tech tree, but there's also a big gap between like useful AA after the M16 but all the way up until like the M247 Sergeant York, and honestly it's not really worth trying to grind out that specific tech tree. The Tank Destroyer tech tree has some of the strongest vehicles in up tiers because most of them either have really good mobility or really powerful guns. However, the Tank Destroyer part of the tech tree is a little sparsely populated, so depending on what other lines you've selected, it might not actually have the population to get you all the way to the end. However, the Tank Destroyer branch does have one of my favorite vehicles for grinding the American tech tree, which we'll get into in a minute. Now one thing important to realize when you're looking at the tech tree is that each vehicle can research one rank above it and one rank below it efficiently. That doesn't mean you can't research rank more than one rank above or below it at all, it just means you're going to lose efficiency and it increases the further you get away. So for example, trying to grind the M1A2 SEP with the M2A4 is theoretically possible but will take forever. One of the advantages of premium vehicles is that while they still only research one rank above them efficiently, they do research all ranks below them efficiently. So you could take a rank 6 premium and research the entire tech tree with that one vehicle and all of your research would be efficient. However, obviously because you don't have a lineup, that might be a little difficult to do unless you pair that with other rank 6 vehicles or uh, some uh, backup vehicles. So the first thing in terms of ways to speed up the grind we're going to look at is premium time. Now premium time is one of those things that goes on sale pretty frequently, so depending on uh, how willing you are to wait, you could realistically never have to pay full price for premium time. It's actually pretty easy to do it. Additionally, premium time also comes in a lot of the pack vehicles that we'll discuss when we're talking about some of the potential premium vehicles you can get to speed up the grind. So you could wait till you're about to grind it, buy a pack vehicle, and use the pack vehicle plus the premium time you get to like grind out a bunch of RP and silver lines very quickly. The big advantage of our, the premium time really comes down to the silver lion urn. While the RP urn is definitely beneficial, silver lions is definitely the biggest bottleneck that most players will experience when going up a tech tree. So this is really the context in which I would evaluate whether or not it's worth it, in addition to the fact that premium time ticks down whether you are playing the game or not. So if you play one hour a week or versus 40 hours a week, the seven days of premium time will tick off regardless. So it's important to evaluate like how much time you have to spend per day on the game before you make the final decision on premium time. Now another tool you can potentially use to speed up the grind are talismans. Talismans are an upgrade you can get for any tank that increases the RP earned pretty noticeably, so they can help you grind through the tech tree. Talismans are generally bought for golden eagles, although sometimes you'll get them from crates, but it is very inconsistent. It's important to remember with talismans though that whenever the game does its half off sales, this will include talismans. So if you have a vehicle you want to talisman and you can afford to wait for one of the summer sales, winter sales, or the various holiday sales, uh, holding off until that comes by to get half off is pretty nice. Now, the American Talisman options are a little dodgy because even some of the vehicles I really like often don't work in up tiers or aren't consistently good enough against the right opponents. So the only real vehicles that I personally would uh, Talisman is possibly the M3A3 Bradley. I think the M3A3 Bradley has an odd playstyle because the launcher stows and then you also can't shoot it while moving as well. So it ends up being a very slow vehicle to play, but if you get the hang of the TOW 2Bs, it can be effective on basically any map and any battle rating, because the TOW 2Bs are a top attack missile, so you can fire them over obstacles at opponent, and if your opponent can't shoot back and you can kill them, it's pretty much always effective. But it's not super consistent. The real talisman option though, and the one that I personally do have a talisman on myself, is the M1128. However, the M1128 is very similar to a premium vehicle, so in order to avoid retreading old ground, I'm simply going to save my uh, assessment for that when we get to the specific premium vehicle that it's very similar to. 
So before we dive headfirst into the premium vehicles, we're going to do a bit of an honorable mention to another vehicle that you will see in that part of the tech tree, and that is the M1A1 AIM. The M1A1 AIM is a variant of the Abrams used by Australia, and it is a squadron vehicle. Now, squadron vehicles, even though they're in the same part of the tech tree as premiums, are very different from premiums. Essentially, the way you get them is if you're in a squadron with good activity, you select a vehicle to be the target for your squadron points, and every like few days or so, it will devote a certain amount of uh, squadron RP based on the activity of your squadron to that vehicle. Alternatively, you can just pay gold to unlock it right away, or the more squadron RP you put into it, the lower the gold cost will get over time. And then, once you unlock it, you still have to pay Silver Lions to actually get the vehicle. And there's a few big problems with these vehicles in terms of how they're different from a, a premium vehicle. For example, number one, squadron vehicles don't get the ability to research all ranks, all ranks below them effectively. They still only research the one rank below them effectively like a normal vehicle. Additionally, they don't get any bonus silver or research point earnings like a normal premium vehicle. And lastly, and this is probably the worst part for the AIM, you don't get all the upgrades from the word go. You have to research all your upgrades, and the AIM has a rank 3 APFSDS that you definitely need. Like the KEW shell is the only APFSDS, and it's a pretty awful grind. In this respect, if you're looking to grind the tech tree, I would definitely not use squadron vehicles. In fact, I think squadron vehicles are probably one of the worst things in the game you can spend gold on, because even after you spend gold on them, you still have to spend silver on them, and you still have to grind out their upgrades, and they don't give you any real bonuses to make the rest of the tech tree better. So unless it's offering extra utility, they're not really a great buy, and this extends to the M901 as well. Now, as far as the M1A1 AIM itself, the M1A1 AIM is fine. I mean, it's an Abrams. It has the strengths and weaknesses of Abrams. We'll go into those a little bit more as we get to some of the premiums, because there are premium Abrams. But uh, overall, like compared to the M1A1 HC, the M1A2, and the M1A2 SEP, it doesn't really stand out. Um, so I'm not super bully on the AIM. It's fine, especially if you get it effectively for free by just paying the Silver Lions, uh, if you're in a squadron with high activity. But overall, I don't think it's really worth spending gold on. And this neatly brings us to our very first actual premium vehicle. This is the M728 CEV, and we're going to keep this short and sweet because, to put it bluntly, this vehicle is not worth it as a grinder. The vehicle itself has an M60 hull at 7.0, which actually isn't bad. Uh, the mobility, not anything special, but for a 7.0 tank is fine. The big problem with this is the gun. The gun is only fires Hesh rounds, which is a high explosive round. Uh, the gun has a low velocity, it has uh, a low reload, and the damage is really inconsistent. So while smacking somebody with a large high explosive round can be reasonably amusing, this vehicle is never really going to be an efficient grinder. One thing I will note though is that this is a pack vehicle. Now, pack vehicles when they go on sale are actually better than Golden Eagle vehicles when they go on sale, because with a pack vehicle, they come with Golden Eagles and they come with premium time, and they come with the same amount of Golden Eagles and premium time no matter how much or little you pay for them. So a half-off pack vehicle, you still get the same amount of GE and the same amount of premium time. However, pack vehicles do go on sale less often. So pack vehicles can be better than GE vehicles, but it's just it just kind of depends on how much you're paying for it. But overall, the M728, uh, even as a pack vehicle, still not a great buy as a grinder. Our next vehicle is going to be the T114 light tank. Now, the T114 is kind of an interesting little vehicle. It doesn't have any real armor to speak of. It is technically uh, fully enclosed, so it's not as easy to overpressure, but you really shouldn't anticipate surviving anything up to and including heavy machine guns. One thing to note about the T114's mobility is that it's not super fast, but it is very responsive. Uh, the engine can struggle a little going up hills, and the top speed isn't that high. But it, does, it is such a light vehicle and such a small vehicle that it accelerates and turns very well. Now, the T114 actually looks bigger than it is because for some reason the camera just zooms in a lot, but it is incredibly small. It's about the size of the M50 or the uh, M56. The real odd feature about this, though, is the gun. The gun is a recoilless rifle with a three-round magazine that fires heat rounds. It doesn't have the highest velocity in the world, but it does have a really good rate of fire. And this makes the vehicle kind of forgiving in a way, in that 
even if your first shot isn't well on target, especially at 7-3, a lot of enemy vehicles don't react super fast if you miss or if your first shot doesn't necessarily do the damage you want. So the vehicle can be pretty forgiving, and it's also very trolly given how small and annoying it can be to fight. Overall, the T114, I would definitely say it's worth it. This is probably one of the stronger grinders you can get in the American tech tree. You can have really good games in it. And what's perhaps more important is that it works well in up tiers. The lack of a stabilizer does hurt it a little if you take it a little too far up. However, the gun generally remains effective, the mobility is good, and obviously the small size and trolley nature of the vehicle means it can still work, especially if you're willing to be a little ratty. Overall, I think even at full price, this vehicle is probably still worth it for most vehicles. But it's, it's important to remember that this is an older uh, GE vehicle, so they do go on sale pretty frequently. So this is one of those things where, yeah, it would be worth it at full price, but the nature of the vehicle means you probably don't ever have to pay full price for it. But uh, either way, uh, definitely consider this if you are looking to grind the American tech tree. And for our next vehicle, we have the T-54E1. Now the T-54E1 is another kind of an odd vehicle because in terms of its armor, in a max down tier you're fighting older World War II vehicles that will be using armor piercing high explosive rounds which your armor can be reasonably effective against. However, in a max up tier you're fighting newer enemies who are going to be firing rounds like APFSDS rounds that your armor is that completely useless against. So the armor is kind of all over the place and shouldn't really be counted on, but it does often survive a hit, uh, but I definitely wouldn't bait shots with it. The mobility is pretty modest, it's about on par with some of the M48s, M60s, it's not really anything to write home about, but it's not completely tragic. What really sets this people vehicle apart is the gun. The main gun fires uh, APDS rounds that penetrate about 420 millimeters of armor at the maximum, and these rounds are very high velocity, they're very easy to aim. Additionally, if you're used to APDS rounds, you're probably used to these rounds not having the best internal damage. But the uh, mass on the T-54E1's rounds is so high that the game basically treats them like large caliber AP rounds, which means they actually do have pretty decent damage. Um, like, they will just go straight through an enemy and drag a ton of shrapnel and wipe them out. Additionally, you have an autoloader with a pretty fast reload. And as a kind of a side note, this vehicle does have a four-man crew, and one of the crew members is an auto is a loader whose sole job is to feed the autoloader. So it does refresh its drum reasonably easily as well. This makes the T-54E1 kind of an odd vehicle in that it really is just a gun on tracks, but the gun is incredibly effective against basically every enemy you'll meet. If you just want to drive around and click on the middle of enemies, the T-54E1, uh, you could do a lot worse. However, I am going to go with a, this vehicle is fine as half price, and the big reason why is because the T-5041 lacks a stabilizer and does commonly in up tiers and even at its own BR sometimes fight enemies with stabilizers, so it can be a little unresponsive, the armor is kind of inconsistent, and occasionally the gun just doesn't want to cooperate, but by and large I do think the vehicle can be effective, especially if you can get it on a sale. So overall, I don't think it's the best option, I think the T-114 is probably going to do better for a lot of players at around the same uh, rank but the T-5041 is by no means bad. Now as a quick side note, the next few vehicles we're going to go into are modern vehicles, so there are two features that you want to make sure you have buttons mapped for. The first one is night vision mode. Uh, in While night vision mode it can be useful for night maps, the real use of night vision is that it will turn on your thermal imaging, and thermal imaging will make enemies stand out a lot clearer, so it's easier to pick enemies out at a distance. The next feature is the rangefinder. Now all the vehicles we're about to talk about have laser rangefinders. So what this means is not only will it find the range very quickly, but it will automatically set the distance in your view. So you don't actually have to aim up or down or manually set the sight elevation, it will set it for you. And this can make it very easy to land shots at long range and it's important with all these vehicles to know to have buttons mapped and know how to use these two features. For our next vehicle we have a real War Thunder classic. We have the XM1 or more accurately the XM1's plural. There are actually two of them. Now the two different versions are the Chrysler and the GM. The big difference is that the Chrysler has the gas turbine engine so it has a little better acceleration and uh, handling and also a little better power to weight, and the GM has slightly better armor, but not really so much that you notice, and you'd think with that spread that the Chrysler would actually be the higher BR of the two, or they'd be at the same BR, but it turns out the Chrysler is actually at a lower BR. And this is because of the nature of these vehicles, so it turns out you can't actually control which of these two you get. 
if you're on uh, PlayStation or PC, the only vehicle you can get is the uh, GM version, and if you're on Xbox, you get the Chrysler version. So Xbox does get the broadly better version, however, the average Xbox player is apparently not very good. So if you're playing on Xbox, you just get an objectively better vehicle at a lower BR, which is pretty nice. Now, as far as the XM1s themselves and their general performance, the armor performance on both of them is pretty weak. It's important to remember when you talk about the armor that these versions don't have like the full production composites that the later M1s will have, so even their turret cheeks armor, which is supposed to be the par strongest part of it, are pretty weak. However, this also means the vehicles are lighter and thus their mobility is significantly better. And this means that the vehicles end up functioning more like heavy light tanks than a true medium tank or a true MBT. And this is probably one of the strengths of the XM1s and why they have so much longevity because it turns out mobility is actually pretty hard to effectively counter. So if you can just get to positions earlier, your opponent doesn't have a good answer for it. As far as the gun, it's more of a standard 105 with this battle rating. It's not the Abrams 105, which we'll talk about a little later, because um, the production Abrams have a different 105, or at least the game treats them differently. Um, your main shell isn't amazing, but it does generally work, and it even works above its battle rating reasonably well. Against common opponents, you won't have a huge amount of difficulty dealing with them. And overall, the XM1 still definitely has it. I would say this vehicle is going to be worth it for the vast majority of players. Um, even though it is a bit on the older side of things, uh, because it's so far away from top tier, the quality of vehicles it sees is pretty low compared to what a lot of the uh, other vehicles we're going to be looking at see. And the M1's mobility combined with its good gun just makes it a pretty effective package. Now, as it is an older pack vehicle, these do tend to go on sale a lot more often than the newer stuff. So if you do see a pack vehicle sale, this thing is a fantastic deal. It's an absolute steal at half off. Uh, I would definitely recommend it. But even at full price, if you're not willing to wait for a pack, it does still very much work. Now, because this video is about how to grind the Abrams, and of course there are going to be several Abrams in the video uh, featured, including the XM1, it's important to go over the blowout panel mechanic because understanding that should influence uh, what types and how much ammo you take. Now, the blowout panel mechanic is essentially at the back of the Abrams turret, you have two different lockers full of ammo. The left-hand side is the uh, first stage ammo, which is that is the ammo your loader will reach for first. The right-hand side is essentially, it's also ammo, but your loader will reach for that after they've expended the left-hand side. Now, if you only fill up one side, at that point, your vehicle is less vulnerable to things like potential ammo explosions. And it's important to remember that the left-hand side is kind of different depending on what types of guns and shells your tank has. So for the XM1, it has 24 shells in the left-hand side and 24 in the right-hand side, which means you could take 25 shells and the only storage locker that you would have ammo in is the left-hand side and then you would have one in the chamber. 25 is a lot of shells and it gives you a good ability to use the versatility of the XM1 because the XM1 has uh, normal Sabos, uh, it has APFSDS rounds, it has heat, it has hash, it has smoke, so you can take some more situational ammo and still be good to go and not worry about uh, ever running short. This also kind of holds true for the later Abrams. The uh, M1, which we'll talk about a version of it later, has 22 rounds of ammo because it still has the 105, but doesn't have quite as much room. And that particular tank uh, also has access to a decent variety of ammo. So you can take 23 rounds of ammo on the M1 without uh, ammo spilling over into the hull or filling up both of the compartments. Additionally, if you look at the uh, 120 millimeter armed M1s, such as the M1 AIM we just talked about, the M1 AIM and all of the other 120s have 17 rounds in the locker, so you can still take 18 rounds. So you can still take at least some mixture, although they don't have quite as much ammo variety. Now, what, what will happen if the blowout panel is hit is all of the ammo in that storage locker will cook off. Um, generally speaking, this will mean that your vehicle is going to be on fire for a relatively short period. You'll take some damage. All this will depend on how much ammo is specifically cooking off. And then after that, you'll be able to operate and repair the vehicle normally, although you won't have any ammo unless you already had a round in the chamber, in which case you will only have that one round in the chamber. Um, this will put you in kind of a vulnerable state, but it's still generally better than being dead. And this does add to the Abrams survivability, because especially when you consider that a lot of the Abrams are reasonably mobile, it is actually pretty easy for them to recover from an ammo explosion by just running away. Now you should realistically check all of your tanks to see what the first stage ammo is and where it is, and it will be labeled in the x-ray view. 
but for the Abrams in particular, because of the way they store ammo and because it's a huge benefit to only have one of the two lockers full of ammo, uh, I would definitely recommend making sure you know exactly how much ammo is carried in the lockers on the Abrams tank. For our next vehicle, we have the M1128 Wolfpack, which is very similar to the M1128 in the tech tree that I personally use a talisman on, and we'll get to the differences between them in a minute. Now, the M1128, in terms of armor, it doesn't really have any meaningful armor. However, it is pretty resistant to heavy machine guns, and combined with the fact that it's a relatively big vehicle with a lot of empty space, means if somebody's going to shoot you, a lot of times your best strategy is actually to turn full broadside, and that way you give them more parts of the vehicle they can hit that are not critical, whereas if it just goes through the front, the likelihood of it knocking out critical crew or ammo are actually very high. Overall, I would say this is not a particularly effective strategy, or at least not consistent, but sometimes it does work. Now, this is one of the differences between the two vehicles, is that the Tech Tree M1128 has the slat armor upgrade, which is pretty iconic on the Striker family of vehicles. However, in-game this upgrade is not very good, and most people just opt to leave it off as it's quite heavy and the extra protection is fairly limited. In terms of mobility, the M1128 and the Tech Tree and the Premium are both basically the same. They're wheeled vehicles, they have quite good mobility. The reverse speed leaves a little to be desired, but it's not too tragic. As wheeled vehicles, they can be a little awkward in close quarters, but overall their mobility I would rate as quite good. In terms of firepower, this is where we see the biggest difference. The Wolfpack has a M835 as its top shell, which has a little under 400 millimeters as its maximum penetration. The Tech Tree vehicle has M900 as its top shell, which has over 522 millimeters as its base protection, or as its base penetration. So you're looking at a difference of over 120 millimeters in terms of penetration, and that's a pretty big difference. And this is part of the reason why I really recommend uh, talismaning the Tech Tree version and why I talisman it myself is because the M900 works at basically any battle rating. You can use it all the way up to top tier and it will kill the best tanks in the game. Although you can't exactly click on the middle of them, but at 10.0 you can click on the middle of the majority of enemies you meet. However, the Wolfpack having the noticeably weaker shell does limit it a good bit more, especially in things like max up tiers. Currently the Wolfpack is only one battle rating below the M1128, and because of that it still fights mostly the same enemies and mostly fits into the same lineup, except it's just objectively weaker. And I think this is one of the weaknesses of the Wolfpack of the vehicle. Overall, I think the Striker chassis and the gun, especially when you consider that the turret's very low profile and it's very hard to damage the vehicle if all you can see is the turret, definitely work, but I do think the M1128's significantly better shell gives it a lot more longevity than the Wolfpack, and especially when you consider that once you do get the entire tech tree, the Wolfpack becomes kind of redundant to this point. Uh, I do think the Wolfpack is one of those, at half price it's fine, but I probably wouldn't pay full price for it, at least at this point. If they either give the Wolfpack M900, or they drop it a little lower in BR to kind of separate the vehicles a little bit more, I think the Wolfpack becomes a much more viable candidate. But as of right now, it's a little iffy. I don't think it's unusable, and especially as a grinder, it works perfectly fine, because again, mobility is very hard to counter, the gun still basically works. But it does kind of become redundant as soon as you get the Tech Tree M1128, and I do think the Tech Tree M1128 is a fantastic talisman option just because of how much longevity it has. And for our last vehicle today, we have the newest one, the M1 KVT. Now, the M1 KVT is pretty easy to describe because it's an M1 Abrams in the Tech Tree, but it has a visual modification to make it look like a Krasnovian tank division, which is a fictional nation that is used for wargaming purposes. Uh, the visual modifications make it look more like a Soviet tank, give it some of the more distinctive features. However, you can't see the visual modifications in the preview unless you actually own the tank, because for some reason it's not enabled, even though that is the main reason why you'd buy this tank. Uh, this came up when uh, I was talking about the Magok 3 ERA. Somebody couldn't see the ERA when they pulled it up in the preview. If you want to see the uh, actual visual modification without buying the tank, uh, the best way to do it is take it into a test drive uh, and make sure it's set to reference because that'll have uh, all of the upgrades researched and that will show you how uh, it looks with all of the modifications, both researched and enabled. Now, the visual modifications themselves aren't purely cosmetic. There are some minor gameplay things you need to keep in mind, and they're mostly downsides, or they're entirely downsides. So the first thing is that 
the big barrels on the back of the tank will actually inhibit your barrel traversing over the back of the tank. So in some situations, this can make it hard to shoot enemies. However, the normal Abrams is not great at shooting over its engine deck anyways. Enemies directly behind you are usually not going to be in position for you to shoot them unless they're incredibly close, or you're at some kind of incline or they're above you, something like that. So generally, you shouldn't be in these kind of positions anyway. Uh, so if you're in a position where the barrels are a problem, you probably already made a mistake. So it's not that big of a deal, but it could be a problem in certain situations. The other issue, and this is a more meta one, is the M1 and indeed all of the Abrams family kind of look the same from the front. The M1 has the weakest armor, but it mostly doesn't matter because most opponents at a glance can't pick out that you are the one with the weakest armor. So they'll just shoot for common weak points, which does allow the M1 to get away with having weaker armor a little more easily. However, as soon as you equip the KBT modification, like the Viz mod, anybody looking at you will immediately know that you are the one with the weakest armor if they're familiar with the Abrams family. That being said, most people don't seem that familiar with the exact differences in armor values and like what type of pen you need to go through them, but there are certain situations where if you poke your turret above a ridge line, instead of shooting their breach, your breach to try and disable you from shooting, they could just shoot your gunner and commander in the face and go straight through your turret face. So it, it kind of depends, but both of these are purely negative, but they're also very situational negatives. So you could very easily just enable the Viz mod and leave it on, and people probably wouldn't be able to tell the difference, or you probably wouldn't expect experience any downsides. However, if you do want to turn it off, uh, you just go to the modification screen, you look at the visual mod modification and you just deselect that, and that will completely deactivate the viz mod and you will just look like a normal M1. I think the camouflage is a little different baseline, it has essentially like a Murdeck like, but you could actually change that as well if you feel like it. So uh, easy enough. Now describing the KVT itself, or the M1 specifically, because that's what it is, um, it feels very bare bones when you look at it compared to basically all the other members of the Abrams family. But the fact that you don't have a lot of features like the bigger gun, like the uh, commander's thermals, all the technology, etc., does mean you're significantly lighter. For example, if you were to look at the uh, M1 aim earlier in the video and watch that moving around, that has a listed weight of 62 tons. This vehicle has a listed weight of uh, 55.7 tons, so it's over 6 tons lighter with the same engine. This doesn't give it a better top speed, but it does give it significantly better acceleration than a lot of the other Abrams. As far as the armor itself, the armor is at best inconsistent. You really shouldn't be counting on your armor at this BR in general, and with this tank specifically but it can occasionally save you, and the fact that you have a reasonably spacious interior with four crew members can mean you will sometimes survive hits, especially with the blowout panels, like ammo explosions aren't common, so they do generally have to knock out your crew. But again, I just wouldn't bait shots with it. The real selling point of this is the mobility. This thing really hauls, it moves around more like a big light tank, um, a lot like the XM1 and earlier BRs. So it, it can get to uh, positions very effectively and it can make its presence known on the battlefield very easily. And this means that if you know what good positions look like, you can easily have great games in it. As far as the gun, the shell really doesn't have great penetration. It's around 370 millimeters maximum. However, when I talked about the Abrams reload in the XM1, this is what I'm talking about. The production Abrams, the X, the M1 Abrams, and the IPM1 that use the 105 have a much faster reload than the normal 105 reload. In fact, on, on a really good crew, you can get it all the way down to five seconds. And this allows these vehicles, when they get into a good position, to really clean up. And even though the shells aren't exceptional, they're good enough that if you know where to aim and you're good enough at aiming, you can definitely kill anything you can come across. So the real selling point of the Abrams is that it just kind of works. Everything is at least good enough, and the things like the mobility are actually pretty uh, exceptional, and the reload's quite good as well. And on top of that, in terms of the gun, because you're using the 105, you do have a slightly better ammo selection than the other Abrams using the 120. You have things like, uh, you have Hesh rounds, you have Heat FS rounds, and you have uh, Smoke rounds, whereas the normal Abrams mostly just have the Sabo and the Heat. So you do have a little bit more variety for dealing with certain situations, so that's always nice to have, but you may not make the best use of it, it kind of just depends on your personal preference. Now. When looking at this brand new vehicle, it's always awkward to try and figure out whether or not I want to recommend it, and ultimately I am going to say the KVT is worth it, but because it is a new vehicle, I feel the need to justify that a little bit more than some of the other vehicles that have uh, appeared in this video. So on a macro, on a micro level, like the moment-to-moment -moment gameplay, 
the mobility and rate of fire both allow you to get into positions very easily and use those positions very easily. And mobility and rate of fire are two things that don't necessarily have a good hard counter. On top of that, the fact that your armor isn't completely useless and your penetration is still enough to deal with everything, even when it's not exceptional, means that if you're a good player, you can definitely have good games. And if you're an average player, you can still get into good positions and still clean up, especially if you learn where to aim on key targets. So this has all the tools it needs to have good games. Going on to the macro, like the big picture, the majority of games I was having were between 9.3 and 10.3 or 9.7 to 10.7. And this appears to be kind of uh, a lot of there are a lot of premiums around 9.3 to 10.3. So you will get matchmakered into a lot of those. Additionally, most nations don't appear to have great lineups for 11-3 and 11-0, so you tend to see like that 9-7 to 10-7 or 11-3 to 10-3 bracket a lot, which means you don't really get max up tiers all that often in the uh, M1, which worked out really well in its favor. And going even further on the macro, <laughs> I'm definitely not going to recommend you go out and buy a ton of premiums. However, a lot of people do already have American premiums, and if you do have American premiums, there are a total of six of them that will work well in a lineup with the KBT. Uh, this is the XM1, the M1128 Wolfpack, the Harrier, the Warthog, the F5C, and the A6E Tram. All of these go perfectly fine in a lineup with the uh, KBT, so if you already have one of those and you're looking at the prospect of getting a KBT, that could be a potential selling point for you. Additionally, the KVT doesn't become completely redundant once you have every vehicle in the tech tree unlocked because it's an Abrams with better rewards multipliers and some optional cosmetics. So overall, I think the KVT, like, I can't come up with a major downside. Maybe the fact that it doesn't have any, like, handholds. Uh, the gun and armor aren't idiot-proof, I guess, would be about the biggest downside I have for this vehicle. Um, it doesn't offer unique playstyle. But as far as grinding, I think this vehicle is very effective, so I do kind of have to recommend it. I think it just works. And that concludes our video. I hope you had fun. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you learned something. And if you did, please leave a like and uh, subscribe, and feel free to comment on the video. Uh, have a nice day, everybody.